So uh, this morning we're going to continue our study of chapter 3. We began uh, the study last week. Uh, we took up the first verse uh, of chapter 3. Uh, when it says, finally my brothers rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. So basically what Paul is saying here uh, with that word finally is not... That word finally is not the climax, it is not the ending. Uh, instead, that word finally means that, uh, you know, for, as for the rest, as for everything else. Uh, and that's why, that's what Paul is trying to do. He's trying to summarize everything that he has said before. And he's trying to say, and he's trying to tell us, you know, and draw our attention to whatever he's going to say uh, after. Uh, so when he says finally, uh, that's, that's, you know, that's what it means. It doesn't mean the ending. It doesn't mean the climax. Uh, the, the word for finally in the Greek is, is the word loipos. And again, it means as for the rest. Uh, and, the, and the rest of the verses, uh, or the, sorry, the rest of the verse contains what Paul wants us to, you know, wants to draw our attention to. Uh, and the number one thing that he wants us to uh, he wants us to kind of pay attention to or to notice uh, when he says uh, finally as us for the rest he says my brothers rejoice in the Lord uh, you know this is probably the the, the theme the, the the number one topic here in this letter to rejoice in the Lord in good times and especially in bad times. Uh, we've seen that. We've seen Paul say rejoice in the Lord while he was in prison. We've seen him say rejoice in the Lord while there are others out there who is trying to compete against him. We've seen right now he's saying rejoice in the Lord before he says all these warnings in verse 3. Uh, so what that, this is the, the main message of this book is that uh, to rejoice in the Lord no matter what situation you're in, rejoice in the Lord. And when we get to chapter 4, He's going to kind of unpack that some more. What does it mean to rejoice in the Lord in any situation? Uh, we'll see that in chapter 4, and some of you probably know where I'm going with this. Chapter 4, verse 13, you know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's the context of what that verse is to rejoice in the Lord, be content in any situation. So that's the first thing that uh, Paul draws our attention to here in chapter 3. Uh, the second thing that he draws our attention to here is that he's going to be repeating himself over and over again. Uh, and at the same time, that this repeating is no trouble to him, that he, he likes it. He, 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 you know, it's, no, it's not like he's, you know, he's begrudgingly doing it. He's repeating himself joyfully for the benefit of those who are listening, for the benefit of the Philippian believers, and for the benefit of us here uh, this morning. So that's what he says. Uh, I write, uh, to write the same things to you is no trouble to me. And also, this is good for you. This is safe for you. This is what we took up last week. Uh, that's why I said last week, if somebody's repeating him, himself or herself, telling you the same things over and over again, you know, instead of, uh, you know, taking it as nagging, uh, we should rejoice. Uh, we should rejoice and be thankful that there's somebody who's taking the time uh, to actually teach us and to actually help us grow. Uh, and that's what Paul is doing here uh, with us and with the Philippian believers that he's writing to. Um, so um, I also said last week that the reason why he's saying this, why he's saying rejoice in the Lord, why he's saying um, I'm going to be repeating myself and it's safe for you, is because he's about to give us uh, warnings. He's about to give us some warnings uh, here in chapter, or, sorry, in, in uh, verse uh, Two, okay. So he's about to give us some warnings here in verse two. Uh, and again, I made mention of this last week that uh, what he's about to warn us, he's, he's already mentioned in the previous two chapters uh, that there is opposition. Uh, Paul says there is opposition uh, when it comes to the advancement of the gospel, especially in in Philippi. Uh, so right now, what we're going to do is we're going to read uh, verse two. And we're going to look at what the, this opposition is, or who this opposition is. And then we're going to unpack it uh, for, for the rest of our time here today. So let's go open up our Bibles here uh, in Philippians 3, verse 2. It says here, look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, and look out for those who mutilate the flesh. Look out for the dogs, look out for the evil viewers, look or evil viewers, evil doers, and look out for those who mutilate 
the flesh. So it's a threefold warning uh, that Paul is doing here. And he's describing for us the opposing forces or opposing force that are coming or are already there uh, to go against the advancement of the gospel in Philippi. Again, if you look at the warnings, uh, it's, there, there's three of them. Look out for the dogs, evildoers, and those who mutilate the flesh. Now, first reading this, uh, I know some of you probably are thinking, that this is the same thought process that I had once I first read this, um, that there are three different opponents that Paul is describing here. Okay? Dogs, evildoers, and those who mutilate the flesh. Um, but my question was, and when, when I was studying this, uh, and based on the context, is there three? Is there three different opponents here? Or is Paul describing just one opponent, but is using all these three descriptions to describe them? Uh, that's the question that I, would, that I have for you this morning. Is there really three opponents that are you know, attacking or are, are hindering the advancement of the gospel in, the, in Philippi? Or is there just one group that Paul is describing as dogs, evildoers, and those who mutilate the flesh. Uh, this morning I would argue that Paul is warning the Philippians of just one group. Okay? Uh, described as dogs, evildoers, and those who mutilate the flesh based on the context that we're in. Okay? And I would say that this is the same group that Paul you know, uh, wrote about in Galatians. It's the same group that... You know, the Galatian believers listened to. That, that, that's why Paul is, uh, you know, wrote to them that, that letter to tell them, oh, these, these people are false teachers. They are not preaching the same gospel that I preach. In fact, they're preaching no gospel at all. And if you remember who these people are, these people are the, the Judaizers. Uh, so I think, uh, and I think based on the context, that the people or the, the group that Paul is is describing here that he's warning the Philippians about is just one group. They're not, it's not three groups. It's one group of people, and it's, I think, the Judaizers. And I think if you read through, the reason why I, I, you know, I come to this conclusion is because when in verse 3, Paul says, because, so he says, look out for these dogs, look out for these evildoers, look out for these who mutilate the flesh, because, in verse 3, because we are the circumcision. Uh, if you remember who the Judaizers were, they're the ones who are preaching that, oh, you need to be circumcised in order to be a true Christian. If you're not circumcised, you're not really accepted into the family of God. You have to be Jew first. You have to receive the mark of Abraham, Abraham's covenant first uh, before you become a Christian. That's why Paul mentions circumcision in verse 3, and we're going to get into that later on. But this is why I think that when, he, when Paul talks about look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, and look out for those who mutilate the flesh. He's referring to the same group. He's not referring to three different groups. All right? So these, these again, this group is the Judaizers. The Judaizers. Um, and again, Paul's biggest issue with them is that they need, they're trying to negate the gospel uh, news, that the gospel is uh, good news because the gospel is, is, is God saving believers by his grace. Nothing in them can, you know, could influence God. Nothing in us has influenced God to save us or to justify us before himself. It is only by his grace that he has given us the faith to be justified or to be reconciled with him. This is the argument that Paul has been, um, you know, preaching all throughout uh, the Galatians and now even in the Philippians and even in the Corinthians, if you read the Corinthians, it's the same group that keeps on, you know, um, negating Paul's teaching of what the true gospel is, adding works to it, adding, you know, uh, some kind of fleshly uh, sign, some kind of, you know, fleshly evidence uh, that makes you justified before God. Meanwhile, you know what? The gospel doesn't say that. Uh, if you read, um, you know, for, even from the Gospels and even all of Paul's, um, you know, letters, he's always been consistent with what the Gospel is. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, not by any works that we do. Uh, it, it, that's just not what the Gospel is. We are justified by grace alone, through faith alone. And now these people keep coming and keep 
you know, and keep on refuting and keep on negating what Paul is doing. So what we're going to do this morning uh, uh, is what we're going to look at these three warnings. Uh, we're going to see how these three warnings point to the Judaizers. Okay, We're going to look at these three warnings and see how these warnings point to the Judaizers and why Paul, again, urgently warns the Philippian believers uh, about this approaching enemy. Uh, I say approaching uh, because after this, he never mentions them again. Now, there's a couple of reasons for that, and we're going to get to that uh, later on. So, um, so the first thing, uh, let's look at. First thing that Paul's warnings include uh, in description of the Judaizers are uh, dogs. Okay? Uh, look out for the dogs. Look out for the dogs. Now, uh, I don't know about you, I'm a dog lover. Uh, I know some of you probably think, no, you're not. Uh, you tortured your last dog. No, I did not torture my last dog. Uh, you know, contrary to some some news, some fake news going out there that I tortured my last dog. I did not. Uh, it was just the wrong timing for us to get a dog at that point in time. <laughs> That's why my dog, uh, Cody, back then, um, you know, didn't have the time of his life <laughs> staying with us, so to, so to speak. Uh, but I am a dog. I've had a dog. Uh, I've had dogs uh, ever since I can remember. You know, in the Philippines, I, we had two dogs, uh, Poco and, and Pogi. Uh, you know, one died of natural causes, one died of unnatural causes. But uh, both of those dogs I loved, uh, and I still do. I, uh, in fact, I'm getting a dog in a couple of weeks. Uh, I know some of you are probably, oh, no, you're going to torture another dog. No, I'm not going to torture this. <laughs> I'm not going to torture this next one. Uh, I'm actually going to, you know, I'm not at a point where we can actually take care. As a family, we can take care of the dog. So pray for us, though. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's like having a new, a new baby at home. So, um, but yeah, I love dogs. Uh, and I believe that dogs are man's best friend. If you watch YouTube and, uh, you know, and even in Facebook videos, they show dogs always, you know, with their, with their owners. They even have a video of uh, these dogs just... Uh, uh, not wanting to leave their owners, even uh, when their owners died, uh, they had a dog who wanted to stay uh, in the cemetery. Just wanted to stay with with the, uh, her owner, um, you know. After even after the owner died, and if you watch that movie Hachiko, you know that's a popular dog movie. Hachiko, uh, uh, same thing. When his owner died, he kept going back to the train station trying to wait for his owner until he died. Uh, so yeah, dogs are that. Dogs are really loyal. They are men's best friends and, and and i think you know there are some dogs who would literally die for their for their owners and that's how loyal dogs are uh, but these are the dogs that we know today um, you know the domesticated dog um, but back in the first century where paul was writing in uh, when you mention dogs it is not a popular or a positive thing uh, dogs were viewed differently back in the first century. According to one commentary, and I'm going to read this to you, and I quote, um, a, culture, a culture that spent billions of dollars on dogs as pets can scarcely appreciate the basic contempt that ancient society had for dogs. So, so he's talking about us. We're the culture that spends millions of dollars on dogs as pets. Uh, that's why it's hard for us to kind of uh, understand how much dogs are hated or were hated back in Paul's days. Because dogs back then were both scavengers, uh, eating whatever street garbage they could find, and they were vicious, attacking the weak and helpless. Uh, they get nearly universal bad press in the Bible, and thus are metaphorically applied to humans only pejoratively. Or when you apply the term dog to a human, it's meant to uh, express contempt or express disapproval. Uh, so uh, the Jews uh, sometimes used dog to designate or to refer to Gentiles. Um, so back in those days, um, when somebody calls you a dog, uh, right now you, you hear young people, right? oh, yeah, he's my dog. Oh, he's my dog. Uh, it's positive, right, right now. But back in those days, somebody called you a dog, uh, yeah, no, it's negative. Uh, they hate you. Uh, they think you're bad. They think you're, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're a scavenger. They think you're, you're, you know, you're dirty. Uh, and that's how I sometimes Jews uh, call Gentiles dogs. Um, 
That's why uh, when you look at Paul's description of them, he's kind of turning the tables on these Jewish, uh, the Judaizers, by calling them dogs. Because to Paul, what they're doing, uh, you know, preaching this wrong gospel, influencing new believers, baby Christians, to think that for them to be saved, they have to do something. Uh, they have to, uh, you know, work, in a sense, um, is, is bad. And that's why Paul is kind of reversing, flipping the tables on these Judaizers and calling them uh, dogs. So instead of the Gentiles being dogs, he's referring to the Judaizers being dogs. Um, and he's doing this uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, um, you know, because the Judaizers uh, have been, you know, following Paul and, and, you know, trying to negate every preaching of the gospel that he's doing in these new churches. Uh, he, he's referring to them as dogs because he, they're dogging him. You know, when, when that term dogging, uh, you know how dogs keep following the owner around? That's what the Judaizers are doing to Paul. They're dogging Paul throughout Paul's ministry. That's why you see, you see them mentioned in the Galatians. You see them mentioned here in the Philippians. You'll see them mentioned in Corinthians. Uh, that these Judaizers are always going around talking to the, the new believers, the new Gentile believers, and telling them, no, 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 for what Paul says is wrong. Uh, what you guys need to do is get circumcised. You need to be Jewish first before you get into to the family of God. Uh, and Paul says, no, nope, that's not the gospel. That's not what I preach, and you shouldn't listen to that. Uh, but again, just like um, what I said earlier, these, these Judaizers just keep on. Just keep on preaching this anyway. Uh, so that's the first reason why uh, Paul is calling them as dogs. Uh, the other reason Paul is calling them dogs is because like a dog back in the first century, uh, you know, uh, these, um, these Judaizers are, are taking advantage or preying on the weak uh, and the helpless baby Christians in the churches that Paul has planted. So if you, um, again, if you read Galatians, if you read Philippians and, and the Corinthians, that's what these Judaizers are doing. They go to the baby Christian, the Gentile Christians. And because, you know, they're baby, they're, they're, they're still weak when it comes to their faith. Whatever the Judaizers are saying to some of them, um, they listen to. Uh, and when they say, oh, oh, I have to get, you know, circumcised. That means I have to do something for my salvation. Okay, cool, I, I'll do that. Uh, but Paul, in this letter and in Galatians and even in the Corinthians, uh, there's, he's saying, no, 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 don't listen to these people. Uh, what they're saying is not the gospel. That's not what the gospel meant, or that's not the gospel news. Um, again, here in Philippians, he doesn't spend a lot of time kind of refuting these, uh, these Judaizers. But in the Galatians, he spent most of the book uh, refuting the false gospel that the Judaizers preached. Uh, and that has infiltrated the church. Uh, now, the reason why here in Philippians, he always says a couple of sentences, uh, a couple of verses about them, uh, is because uh, a majority of the believers in Philippi uh, did not listen to the Judaizers. Uh, most of them were mature enough to say, no, that's not the gospel that we preach. That's not the gospel that Paul preached to us. That's not the gospel that we're advancing uh, together with Paul. Uh, so, well, after this uh, mention in verse 3, or sorry, in verse 2, you'll never hear uh, Paul mention uh, the Judaizers again. Uh, so, that's why he's referring to them as dogs. So, first of all, because they keep following him. Uh, and second of all, uh, these Judaizers are preying on the weak the way the first century dogs did uh, back in Paul's day. Uh, so, that's the first thing that Paul calls them. Calls them dogs. Second, Paul referred to them as evildoers. Or in 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen, Paul refers to them as deceitful workers. Uh, so what Paul is doing here is, is emphasizing that these Judaizers, they pose as workers of the gospel or workers for the gospel. Just like Paul and the Philippians were. But they don't preach the same gospel that Paul and the Philippians preached. That's why they're, they're called evil or doers or deceitful workers in the Corinthians. Evil doers in the Philippians, right? Because that's what they're doing. They're working. They look like they're working to share the gospel, but really they're sharing the wrong 
one in order to deceive those who has received the real gospel, right? So that's why he refers to them as evil workers and deceitful, or deceitful workers or evil doers, okay? That's quick. That's pretty self-explanatory. Let's move on. Third, uh, Paul refers to the Judaizers as those who mutilate the flesh. Uh, now again, uh, what Paul is doing here is he's using a play on words. Uh, but you can only see the play on words if you look at the Greek word for mutilate. Okay? For mutilate and for circumcise. Okay? Now in the Greek word, okay, circumcision in the Greek is the word peritome. Okay? Peritome in the Greek which translates, literally translates to, to cut around. Okay, that's what it means to be circumcised, to cut around. Uh, so to cut the skin, the foreskin, and to cut around. That's peritome in the Greek. Now here in, in chapter 3, verse 2 of Philippians, Paul uses the word katatome. Okay, do, you see the, do you see the similarity? Peritome and katatome. Uh, katatome, when you translate it in English, is uh, uh, to mutilate or to cut to pieces. Uh, so that's what Paul is saying here. Because uh, the, the Judaizers, would, they would come in with the news of, oh, Christians, you have to be circumcised. You have to receive the mark of the Abrahamic covenant in order to be truly saved. They're talking about peritome, but really, since they're they're preaching the wrong gospel, Paul is saying, no, 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 they're not talking about peritome. They're talking about Katatome. Uh, they're talking about mutilation because that is not what the gospel preaches. Uh, so again, Paul uses this word, katatome, or to cut to pieces. He used the same uh, word uh, for cutting in um, Galatians 5.12 when he, when he told the Judaizers to, to go castrate themselves. Right? I wish those of you who I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves or castrate themselves. So instead of peritome to just cut around, Paul uses katatome. You know, just cut the whole thing off. Um, so because you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. You're not sharing the gospel as it was, as it was uh, meant to be shared. Uh, that the gospel is good news because we are saved by God's grace. Nothing that we do. Uh, not even um, this, 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 this mark of the circumcision that the, the Judaizers keep talking about. So he keeps using these, uh, <laughs> Paul used that word in order to, again, to negate, to turn the tables on uh, the Judaizers so that the Philippian believers uh, would know that what these people are doing is not right. It is not for your good. It is only for, um, you know, for, you know, danger to you. Uh, in terms of spiritual uh, danger. Um, so when we look at that, when we look at those three descriptions, it's clear uh, that the warnings that Paul is, has given the Philippians in verse 2 uh, does not refer to three different opponents. Uh, it's just referring to one common opponent, and those are the Judaizers back in Paul's Days. In fact, one commentary said this, uh, Fee's commentary says, to see three different groups here displays uh, insensitivity both to the context and the rhetoric. Uh, rhetoric means how it was delivered, how the message was said. Um, so to see different groups displays insensitivity both to the context and the rhetoric. And I, I mean, when I first read it, okay, I thought there were three different ones. If you read some commentaries by Calvin or some older commentaries, they're referring to three different groups of, of people. The last one being the Judaizers, okay? Those who mutilate the flesh. But the first two were not referred to as Judaizers in some commentaries. But, uh, you know, I, I, I disagree. I, I agree with this view that, um, you know, the, the groups that Paul is warning the Philippians about is just one group. Um, and it's because of the context that we're in. So Paul says, look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. And then you look at the next verse, and it gives you the context. For or because, right? That, that, that word connects verse 3 to verse 2, right? When you see for, that connects verse 3 to verse 2. Paul is giving a reason 
why he's warning them about these people, about the dogs, the evildoers, and the, uh, those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision. So Paul is saying, what they're talking about is not true circumcision. We're the circumcision, Paul is saying. And who are these? Who, who, who is what Paul referring to when he says, we are the circumcision? Uh, and by the way, the fact that he mentions circumcision, uh, again, it refers back to um, those three descriptions as referring to the Judaizers. Right? When he says circumcision, that's the main uh, that's the main thing of the Judaizers is to get people to be circumcised because that's the only way to be, you know, be reconciled with God. Uh, and Paul says, no, that's not the way. That's, not, that's the wrong circumcision you're talking about because, Paul says in, chapter, in verse 3, because we are the circumcision. Uh, uh, that's, what, you know, that's what Paul is, that's how he refutes the Judaizers, saying we are the circumcision. Now, what does he mean by that? What does Paul mean when he says, we are the circumcision? All right? Two answers, okay? Uh, first, a quick answer. Quick answer uh, would be to read the rest of the verse. Uh, read the rest of verse 3. For we are the circumcision. Who is the circumcision, Paul? We who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. That's the answer. Who are these circumcision? Why do you say we are the circumcision? Because we are the ones who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Okay? That's the answer to our question. Who are the circumcision? But that's the quick answer. Okay? Let's dig a little bit deeper. Okay? Let's, let's dig a little bit deeper in order to unpack that, that phrase. We are the circumcision, and then for us to understand what that really means. Uh, first thing to notice in that phrase, we are the circumcision, is the word we. Okay? So in Paul's statement, when he says we are the circumcision, he's referring to both Jews and Gentiles, himself as well as the Philippian believers, are included in the circumcision. So do you see the difference? Uh, the Philippian, the, sorry, the, the Judaizers are saying, Gentiles, even though you're Christians, you're still not part of us, right? We are Jew, Jewish Christians. This is what you're supposed to be. So therefore, for you guys to be part of our group, you need to be circumcised. And then Paul is saying, no, 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 that's not it. Because we, all of us, because Paul was a Jew, right? And then... He's referring to the Philippian believers as the, the Gentile believers. He's saying, we are the circumcision. We are included already in, when we talk about the circumcision. Both Jews and Gentiles are included. Anybody who worships the Spirit of God and glory in Christ, they are part of the circumcision. Right? It does not matter whether you are a Jew or or a Gentile. Okay? So that's the first thing you have to notice there. When he says we are the circumcision, when he says we, that's a refute of the Judaizers teaching. Um, so he's saying both of us are included in this. That doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile. If you worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ, you're part of the circumcision. Uh, second thing to notice in that phrase, we are the circumcision, is the word worship. Okay? It says, it says, we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus. That word worship, when you first read it, the um, first thing that comes to mind is, uh, you know, the congregational worship. Those who come to the same church to worship God. Um, that's not what Paul means here, okay? When he says, though the, the circumcision are those who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ, he's not referring to congregational worship. He's not referring to the church per se, that everybody in the church who comes into worship is part of the circumcision. That's not what he means because we, well, me and you know, and there's a saying that not all people who go to church are Christians, and that's true. And that's not what Paul is saying here. He's saying that, 
Uh, he's not saying that all people who worship or go congregational worship are the Christians or are the circumcision. But what does that mean? What does that word worship mean? So you go back to the Greek, the original Greek word used for that. Uh, the original Greek word used here uh, that is translated worship is the word latriontes. Latriontes, okay, in Greek, which literally means a hired servant or a servant, or it means to serve. Uh, uh, the, the verb means to serve, or it's a hired servant or a slave. So when the, Paul says that the true circumcision are those who worship, again, he doesn't mean those who congregate. He means that those who serve, those who work, those who minister by the Spirit of God. Now, this is important because if you remember, if you backtrack, Right? Remember, um, the, 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 the Paul referred to the Judaizers as evil workers. Evil workers or evil doers. Right? So that, 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 that means that they're not true part of the circumcision. Because they, even though they're working, even though they're serving, they're serving the wrong People or they're serving the wrong God, right? They are preaching the wrong gospel. So again, in, when Paul says that those in the circumcision are those who only are, are the ones who only worship God in terms of serving God, he already kind of covered himself by calling the Judaizers as evil workers. That means they're not included in this, right? They're not included uh, in this. Because the Judaizers were, even though they're workers, they're working for evil. They're working deceitfully, right? So um, if you put all those clues together, um, that the we in the we are the circumcision and the, the, the meaning of worship, uh, when Paul defined those in the circumcision as we who worship uh, by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ, when you put all the clues together, uh, we basically have an understanding of what he means by we are the circumcision. Uh, by basically, what, when, when Paul says we are the circumcision, what he means is that the true Christian, the true people of God, the circumcision, the true people of God, are not the ones who are circumcised by the flesh, but the one who by faith serves and obeys through the Spirit of God for the glory of God. So again, Judaizers, what they're preaching, the mark of the true child of God, okay, the mark of the true Christian is to get circumcised. Paul saying, no. Nope. Why? Because we're the circumcision. Because the mark of the true child of God is a working faith. Not a dead faith that the Judaizers have, but a working faith. Servants of God, who obey through the Spirit of God for the glory of Christ. Okay? I hope everybody understands that. Because once we get to these next parts, the work, the, 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 all the, even, even the work, even the evidence of work, Paul says, that's not me. Right? Even though I can boast in my flesh, all the, all the you know, I can boast better than you, I'm better than you. I'll boast, I'll boast of that. He's going to do that in the rest of chapter 3. That doesn't even count. Because what counts is faith that works. Without faith and it just works, it doesn't count. It's faith that works that counts for somebody to be part of uh, the circumcision, part of the family of God, part of God's people, God's children. And if you look back again, chapter 2, chapter 1, this has been the main train of thought of Paul, right? So the true follower of Christ will live a life that is worthy of the gospel of Christ. Remember chapter 1, verse 27. And what does that mean, to live a life of, uh, that's worthy of the gospel? It means to live a life of humble obedience through faith. Um, and Paul, again, uh, just like what he said at the beginning of this chapter, he repeats himself. Uh, that those who are part of the true circumcision, not those who got the foreskin cut off, 
It is those who are serving, who has faith that works. Faith to serve through the Spirit of God for the glory of Christ. Right? Um, and again, uh, he's doing this to encourage the Philippian believers uh, to not only to continue the work of advancing the gospel, uh, but also to warn them to beware of those who adds to the gospel or preaches a different gospel. Uh, the true gospel, again, is good news because of God's grace. Adding to it negates the grace of God and therefore negates the gospel news. That's why for Paul, there is no boasting in the flesh when it comes to our being made right before God. The only reason we are justified before God is because of the righteousness of Christ that has been graciously credited to us through faith in Christ by God alone. Apart from that, we remain in the wrath of God. We haven't been justified. Right? The only thing that justifies again and again is repeated by Paul, and again and again we repeat here, the only thing that could justify us, make us right before God, is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing else. Now what comes after that is something, is a different topic altogether. Because what comes after that, if you say you have faith, then there has to be good works that follow. All right? And again, that good works, you, you, can't, you can't mix that up and put it before faith. Like, if you have good works, I'll be, more, I'll be justified with, with God. If I just do this, I'll be justified with God. And in fact, that was the topic in Sunday school, right? In Sunday school, the topic was, what about these, uh, these traditions? Is this what makes you right before God? Or is it obedience? Obedience to God's command. In Matthew chapter 14, right? That's what makes us right before God. A right heart before God in obedience because of faith is what makes us right before God. Not any traditions, not anything that we do can make us right before God. In fact, everything that we do, says the prophet, is like filthy rags. Right? Nothing that we do can make us right before God. Only God can make us right with himself through his son, our Lord Jesus Christ. How? By graciously giving us the faith to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why Paul is so uh, adamant. That's why the words that he used to describe the Judaizers are so strong, calling them dogs, calling them evildoers, and those who mutilate the flesh because they are teaching a gospel that is not the gospel. Right? And hopefully we get that. Hopefully we, like the Philippian believers, will not lend an ear to any preaching that goes outside of the gospel that we know. Right? So the best thing, I think the best lesson we can learn from here is from the Philippians. They didn't listen, right? They were grounded in their knowledge of the gospel. They didn't listen to the Judaizers. And hopefully, and by God's grace, we here at GBC will be the same. That we will not lend an ear to anything that just even minutely sounds like it is a works-based salvation and a works-based justification, don't listen to it, right? And the only way you'll know if it's works-based or if it's biblical is if you know your Bible, is if you know the gospel, is if you know the gospel, not just John 3.16 gospel, but the gospel. Why is such good news? Do you know that? Do you, are you comfortable with your knowledge of that, that even though, you know, these false teachings come, you won't be swayed? Either way, right? Are you grounded in the gospel, the true gospel that the Bible preaches, that you know, our salvation, our justification, our being right before God can only be done by God, by His grace. And what does He do with that grace? He gives us faith to believe in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we do that, His righteousness, the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us. Therefore, we are justified. We are made right before God. Um, and then hopefully uh, after that, you also know that, no, this, this journey continues. 
this journey continues. We have to be sanctified as well. That's the evidence, right? That's the evidence of us having that saving faith is that we, by faith, obey and humbly serve the Lord Jesus Christ in whatever it is that he calls us to do. That's the evidence, not circumcision by the flesh or not anything that is done, you know, in order for us to be justified by God. No. Justification is by faith alone, through grace alone. The evidence of that is humility, serving humbly, serving and obeying God's commands for our lives individually. Okay? I hope that that is clear. Uh, and again, uh, Paul, uh, after verse 3, uh, in verse 4, he's going to go through, um, you know, he's going to even this out. So even though he says that the evidence for um, the true circumcision is those who serve God, humbly obey God, that doesn't give us any, any boast, that doesn't give us any reason to boast in the flesh. All right? That's what Paul goes goes into in these next few verses in, in uh, verse 4 all the way down that some, because some people oh I do this I do that oh I did the, the cleaning oh, I did the fall cleaning you didn't you suck you're not a Christian no nope. <laughs> that shouldn't give us any reason any work that we do if we're doing it for the glory of Christ the only bow should be in Christ there should be no boast in our abilities or in the flesh or in whatever it is that we did, even though that is the evidence of the circumcision. We shouldn't be boasting in it. Um, our boast should always be in Christ because even that obedience, remember we talked about this, even that obedience is a faith-filled, faith-oriented obedience. Um, so it has nothing to do with us. Again, the work that we do is empowered through the Spirit by faith, right? And hopefully, uh, when we look at this next few verses in chapter, in chapter 3, four, uh, verse 4 all the way up to 11, we'll get, we'll get what Paul is saying. Um, and he's, uh, we'll get what he means by that, all right? Uh, we'll take up those verses, chapter 3, verses 4 to 11, in the next installment of this mini-series. I hope to see you. Uh, here again for that. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord lift His countenance upon you and give you peace. And give you peace. And give you peace. The Lord make His face to shine upon Gracious, gracious, gracious.